Right, we'll just address all the prayers separately as we go along. So let's just um, start and pray for Cameron. Father, we just thank you that we can come to you and we can bring our loved ones to you. Lord, we do it because we care and we know that you care. And because you care, Father, we know that you are also able to intervene. We are able to push away the powers of darkness. You are able to heal. You are able to restore. And therefore, we pray for Cameron, Father. And I want to pray, Father, that you will just um, uh, intervene in his situation, Lord, and that you will make him uh, realize that God is for him. And, Lord, that all these, uh, the, the load of the work and everything is on him. I just pray, God, that you'll just give him clarity of mind, that you'll help him to just um, filter out the negative things and go with the positive things and, and ask God for help and know that God will help him. I pray for Stacy that supports him, Lord, that you will give her encouragement and that she will know that, Lord, they're never alone in this fight. God is with them all the time. Father, so I pray for that in Jesus' name, that they, they will be encouraged and that Cameron will feel better this day, Lord, in Jesus' name. I pray for this family, Lord, that lived, uh, that lost their mother, this, uh, that um, Craig was talking about. Lord, we, we don't uh, always know what it's like to, to lose a loved one in certain circumstances, but I want to pray for them, Lord, even if they, if they don't know you. We pray that you will just send people to reach out to them, that, you, that you, they will realize that you love them and that you will stand by them and encourage them through all this, Lord, in Jesus' name. And now, Lord, we pray for, for rain. We ask, Lord, that you would just send rain to this dry and barren land, Lord. There's a lot of fires going on. There's people that are li deliberately lighting this, these fires. And, and, Lord, nothing helps. But, uh, Lord, I want to pray that you will just come and intervene, in not only in Australia. Lord, in South Africa, they also got a, the farmers are also battling. Their animals are dying. So I'm just praying, God, that you'll send rain, Lord, that you'll open the heavens and that you'll hear our, our call, that you'll hear the heart of your people. And, Lord, send the rain to this dry land, Lord, so that um, our situation can, can be solved and the, there will be water and the fires will stop. We ask it in Jesus' name, Lord. And I know there's many churches and people praying in this day because it's a national prayer, day of prayer for rain. And we, we come to you as your children and we ask, Lord, that you'll hear our prayer in Jesus' name. And Lord, I want to pray for Diane's back, and I want to pray, Lord, that you will that you will just touch her. Lord, we come against this uh, sickness, this ailment, whatever that caused this back pain. Lord, we come, we want to go right back to Him. We ask, Lord, that you will that you will remove the cause of this back problem, Lord, in Jesus' name. And I want to pray, God, that you would just touch her, that you will that your, your the power of the Holy Spirit will flow through her body, throw through her, through her back right now, and that she will know that she's been touched by the hand of God, and that this thing will go away, Lord, and her back will be better. We ask it in the wonderful name of Jesus, Lord, and we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. God is good. Well, I believe that. Thank you. There's two others that believe that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so now today we're going to start the series on spiritual warfare. Now, as introduction, I want to say that um, when we talk about spiritual wars, warfare, some people's hair raised on their, on their necks and go, whoa, hang on, hang on, is this really something the Bible talks about? You know, should we be talking about this? Are, now, are we going to talk about the devil and demons and all these things? Relax, Okay. The, the, the truth of the matter is, the day you give your heart to Jesus, you engage in a spiritual battle. And we will today look at that. Today, all I want to do is to show you that spiritual warfare is a reality. It's something that we read about in the Bible. It's something that happened to all the people or most of the, the people of God in the Bible. They had to fight through certain things and they had to pray through, through certain things. And in the course of the time to come, we're going we're gonna to look at what is the big problem. Next week, we'll be looking at the three main things that prevent us from getting victory in situations. Okay. And we, what is the three main obstacles in preventing us from, from getting victory? Okay. So just to wet your appetite a bit. So, so when we look at spiritual warfare, we're going to look at the very basic thing. And that is that, um, you know, there, there are things that people don't want to hear 
or they don't want to believe when we talk about spiritual warfare. Now, how would you feel if you had some real good advice, not your own advice, advice from the Bible that you know is true and you can, can that the Bible confirms that, that you want to give to some people in this, their circumstances that they are battling with and they don't want to listen to you because they say we don't believe in that. Doesn't that frustrate you? It frustrates me. Okay. And, and this is one of those th th areas that the church sort of shies away from. You know, spiritual warfare. Ooh, demons. Ooh, the devil. You know, we don't want to talk about that. Well, the truth of the matter is we need to know some things in order to be able to resist the devil. We need to know what strategies he uses against us so that when that happens to us, we know this is the devil. You know, because, you know, in the world around us, people blame God for things that go wrong. Sometimes we blame the devil for things he doesn't even do. Not that I mind. I can give him all the blame because he deserves all the blame. Okay. But sometimes we blame the devil just because we want to shy away from our own responsibilities. And that is also an area that we have to actually exercise spiritual warfare in. Because if we do not take control of the things that I think... We're not going to ever overcome a problem. And sometimes the, think that the things that we think is not the things that is right. Okay. And, but we'll look, we will look at that. So C.S. Lewis. Okay. Just before I go there. Just because we can't see it doesn't mean it's not real. All right. So this is spiritual warfare. There's a spiritual battle going on in the heavenlies. All right, there's angels fighting against demons. You know that there's an angel assigned to you. Do we know that? There's an angel assigned to you. <laughs> Even, <laughs> thank you, Arthur, two, three more, whatever we need. If we pray, remember Jesus on the cross when, when, they, when they mocked him and they said, you, 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 know, you can't even save yourself, but you want to save your, your people. And, and Jesus and said, but he could have called upon 12 legions of angels to come and rescue him from the cross if he wanted to. And let me tell you something. If we're in a difficult situation, we can ask God to send as many angels as is needed to help us in this situation, to push away the forces of darkness. That I think the reason why the church doesn't win a lot of ground in the day that we're living in is we, because we don't fight against these forces. And you know what? God commands us to do that. And we will look at scriptures this morning just to confirm that. All right. So just we can't see it because we can't see it doesn't mean it's not real. C.S. Lewis wrote the following. He wrote that the devil wants two things out of saints. Either that they ignore him and his demons or that there is a heightened curi curiosity about them. So there's two problems here. Two danger areas. The one is that we ignore the fact that we have an enemy and be ignorant of his services, of his plans, or his designs, or his devices. Okay. And the Bible talks about we are not ignorant about his devices. And if we are ignorant, maybe that's the reason why some in some areas of our lives we can't get victory over it. Okay. Because we don't push back. We don't fight. All right. Now, I know I can hear the question coming, but, you know, should we, shouldn't we just focus on Jesus and focus on his victory and focus on the victories that he's given us on the cross? Yes, we should do that. But we should not be ignorant about the devil's devices because we can get a victory over something if we know what we're fighting against. You know, if I don't know who, what I'm fighting against, how do I get victory over it? Amen. So, the question is, do we need to know about the devil? We need to know we have an enemy. Okay, so. The scripture says there, To whom you forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave I it in the person of Christ. Why? Lest Satan should get advantage of us, 
for we are not ignorant of his devices. So there's one example. If we do not forgive people, that is a device. That is something the devil will use against me to destroy me. Just this week, I heard a beautiful testimony on the Christian radio about people in America. Somebody took their child and threw him three stories down a building. The child survived it with a lot of serious injuries. Now, when they got to court, the parents said this, we forgive that man for what he's done to our child. And the judge says, why do you do that? So he said, because if we forgive him, he no longer has control over our minds. And this is something we've got to remember. If we do not forgive something or somebody, it means we give that person or that thing control over our minds. And that will destroy us, not them. Okay. You see what I mean with spiritual warfare? So how do I, how do I war against this? About and, and Satan's attack, forgiveness. Because the moment I forgive, Satan has got no hold on me anymore. Hallelujah. <laughs> but it's so hard to forgive someone that has done wrong to me. Okay? You know what unforgiveness do? I, I, in one of our churches in South Africa... There was a guy, and he told me his testimony one, and he was a big, strong man. He was in business with, with a partner. And that partner, now I'm talking about many years ago, done him in with a million rand. In those days, it was a lot of money. Today, it's not a lot of money. All right. But he done him in with a million rand. And he said he got so angry uh, that he took his gun, put it in his ute, and he drove, and he was going to shoot that man. Can you see unforgiveness? What it would have caused him. Fortunately, his wife phoned the police and said, listen, my husband's on his way there to go and shoot that guy. Please stop him before he does it. And they did. In those days, the police still did their work. But <laughs> okay. So, but that's unforgiveness. It would have destroyed his life and his family's life if he wasn't stopped. Eventually, he worked through it and forgave the person and moved on with his life. Right, so let's carry on. So getting the other point, the other danger is getting so distracted and interested in the devil and his activities that it starts to take over our thoughts. Now, I've seen that too, that people get so into uh, fighting demons and doing, you know, the, the spiritual warfare thing that they are totally distracted from God. And, you know, it's just all about this fight and and. Uh, we don't want that either, okay, because that is what the devil wants. If we can give, if he can get our, all our attention in trying to fight him in our own power, we, we've lost the battle already because we cannot fight the spiritual realm from our physical standpoint or our physical power and expect to win it. Okay, because if, wh why am I saying that? Because if we do not address the works of the enemy in the spirit, through the word of God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, we have no chance of winning. Then it's a lost battle. Okay, so that's the other problem. Right, so. Scriptures confirming that there's a war going on in the spiritual realm. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. I want us to focus on divine power. What is divine power? God's power to destroy strongholds. What is a stronghold? A stronghold is a lie from the devil in my life that I believe. So if the devil tell me you can't, and I believe it, I can't, because it's a stronghold that I believe. It's a lie I believe from the devil. Okay? And it becomes a stronghold in my life. But as long as I believe that lie, it has a hold on me. So the sooner I 
stop believing the lie of the devil, the sooner I can get victory over that lie and become what Christ wants me to become. Okay, now easier said than done. I think most of us might have some kind of stronghold in our life, some lie that the devil has put in our mind that we, s- that we believe or sometimes comes back to us in certain circumstances or situations that we need victory and this lie comes back to us and the devil says, you can't. And you go, oh yeah, I, remind, I, m- I remember my past, I can't lie. Amen? And it becomes a stronghold. So, then he goes on to say, we destroy arguments and every lofty op- opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. Now, this is one of the things that prevent us to have victory that we'll talk more about next week. That is my thoughts. If I do not take these negative thoughts captive by the power of God, by the knowledge of God, to obey Christ, they will have victory over me and me not over them. Does spiritual warfare start to make sense to you now? Because it seems like this is something that actually we should give attention to. Right, let's carry on. Look at this scripture, Ephesians 6 verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Why? Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. The devil is scheming all the time on how he's going to make you fall. Second Peter 3 says that the devil is walking around like a roaring lion, seeking who he can devour. Do you think he's interested in devouring people that do not serve God and and, and non-Christians? No, he's already devoured them. He's already won their minds. He's not interested in devouring them. He's interested in devouring you and me as Christians, as children of God, because he wants to draw us away from God. So he's always got a scheme. He's always got a plan in how to make you fall, and how to get you to believe a lie so that you will not have victory in your life. And that's what we've got to wrestle against. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the the rulers, against the authorities, against the, uh, the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of the evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day um, and having done all to stand firm. Now, what does stand firm mean? Does it mean I just stand and say, with my hands in the air praying to God and the devil comes and boom, pushes me over? Do you, th- you think the devil is scared of me when I just stand with my hands in the air and singing to God? No. Standing firm means Stand firm, because something, the devil is not going to stop unless I show him, I take authority over him in the name of Jesus, I do not believe his lie, and I'm standing firm, bring it on devil, in the name of Jesus, I will stand firm. Now, never challenge the devil, I just used an example, don't challenge the devil, okay, because you're not in a position to do it. Our work is not to challenge the devil. Our work is to stand firm against his schemes and his attacks against us. We don't go and look for trouble, okay? But we push trouble away in the name of Jesus when it comes to us, okay? That is when people start getting too much attention to the devil, when they go and look for trouble and say, come on, devil, bring it on, I'll show you. That's looking for trouble. I can tell you a story about that. I'm not going to do it now. Maybe later I'll tell you about a person that did that and the result. But we'll do that at a later stage. We will win this battle if we endure. It is not without a fight, but it's worth the fight. Have you ever felt like in your spiritual life you just want to give up? You just want to stop going to church because there's so many hypocrites in the church? (laughs) You just want to stop just stop, you know, this church thing because, you know, I'm just not getting victory over my situation. You know, no matter how much I go to church, I just don't get victory. All right? So 
this is where the Bible says we need to endure. Okay, because the, 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 like I said, the devil is not interested in attacking the people that's not in church. He wants to attack the people in the church because this is where he wants to destroy the work of God. And we gotta be watch we gotta watch against that. And I'm just gonna say something that we will talk about later, but something that I want you to know, and that is what is the worst sin that anybody can do in the church? Gossip. That's the worst thing. If somebody comes to tell me and says they they they, they you know they slept with another woman and another person comes to me and he said he gossiped, you know who I'm gonna reprimand first? The person that gossiped. Why? Because the other person didn't harm the church. He didn't harm the body of Christ. He just harms himself. But the person that gossips harms the church, the bride of Christ, and prevents God's work from going on. Okay. So I have no time for a gossiper. None. When we are most likely to get attacked, when are we most likely to get attacked by the enemy? Luke 4.13 says, And when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. Remember when Jesus, just after he was baptized in the beginning of his ministry, he was led to the desert and he fasted for 40 days. And when he was hungry, what did the devil do? Good time to tempt Jesus with food now. Because he's hungry, his energy is down, he's tend to one feeling a bit not on top of the world anymore. Now I'm gonna tempt him. And that is when the devil gets us. Okay. But now listen, I want you to take note of what he said. And when the devil had ended every temptation, when Jesus got victory over the devil, get ye behind me, Satan. The devil went away until an opportune time. So that means the devil wasn't finished with Jesus. He just went away until the next time. So when he saw that he couldn't get at Jesus himself, what did he do? He started using the Pharisees and the Sadducees and uh, the religious people to question Jesus, to test him, to see what they can find against him, to crucify him. Because they didn't like Jesus because he didn't fit into their religion, you know? Because when the disciples ate without washing their hands, they had a problem with that. Jesus, how is it that, you know, the, our, our tradition says, our religion says, our rules and our laws says we've got to wash our hands before we eat, and your disciples, Jesus, don't wash their hands before they eat. What did Jesus answer him? Oh, you foolish people. It's not the pork that I eat that, that harms me. It's the pig in my heart that's the problem. That wasn't Jesus' words, but basically it comes down to that. <laughs> it's not what we put in it that makes our, 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 us dirty. It's what's inside of us, in the heart of man, that actually makes him dirty or good. All right? So, so Jesus was under constant attack until that final blow that Satan thought, yeah, I got him, he's dead now. But because Satan didn't know the whole truth, he actually did us a favor. Well, he thought so. He thought he won Jesus. But Jesus said, I, nobody took my life. Nobody took my life. I gave it because I loved you. That's why I gave my life. All right. So there was no war. There was no boxing match with Jesus and the devil. Okay. There was no fight between Jesus and the devil. Because the devil had never would never have any opportunity. Jesus wouldn't get into a fight with the devil. Why would he do that? He, had, he is the conqueror. Okay? He is more than the conqueror. So, okay, no need to go on about that. Right, so the first attempt when the devil gets us is immediately after conversion. When the excitement of the new life starts to fade, he attacks. How does he attack? Through ridicule from the closest friends and family members, through in intense temptation from the old crowd to do the things that you did in the past. Have you ever heard that? A lot of people that come to know Christ and during my ministry would come and, and just said, it's just so hard. I said, why? He says, because my friends 
tease me about it. My family wants to disown me, especially in the Muslim religion. When they accept Jesus Christ, they get disowned. They will even kill their, their, their children if they accept the Lord Jesus Christ or, or their family members. And, it and that's how the devil attacks because he wants to drive fear into us. He wants to make us feel that we're not loved and we're not accepted. But he's using a big lie because the love of man is not really love. It's a love. It's an eros love. It's a love because if you do what I want you to do, I'll love you. An eros love. But Jesus gives us an agape love. I love you in spite of the fact that you not always do what I want you to do. In spite of the fact that you were a sinner, I gave my life for you. I chose to save you. And you see, this is the lie that we would need to tell these people when we support them. That the love that the people talk about is, not a, is nothing against the love of Christ, which is a total different love. Through reminding them of their failures of the past. You know what I'm talking about? Okay. I'm very familiar with that one. Through distractions of all kinds, entertainment, eating, shopping, hobbies, so that there is no time to take care for the soul. I know you guys don't get distracted at all, but man, if I don't spend time early in the morning with the Lord, I get so distracted during the rest of the day that I just don't get to it. Okay. And I've got a hobby that I love, flying my model airplanes. And I haven't flown it all year. That's sad. No, it's not that sad. Okay. <laughs> I'll get to it when I get to it. Okay. There's more important things. Through making them to think that they can have the best of both worlds, the church and the world. This is the new age that we're living in. This is the new worldview. If you go to church on Sunday, look holy, sing your songs, uh, uh, tell the preacher it was a good message, you can go back on the rest of the week, you can go and just live the way the world lives. Just be part of them. You, they won't mock you, they'll like you. Because you'll tell them the church is just a, a, another habit that some people do. Okay. So this is the way. That people are drawn away. This is the way this, the devil attacks us. He, he cannot read my mind. Listen to what I'm saying. The devil cannot read your mind. So when you have thoughts, the devil doesn't know what you're thinking, but God knows. And you know. And we'll talk about that later in the, during this course. Okay. He cannot read my mind. But he can see what's in my mind by my actions. Right. This is why we have to provide them our new converts with a safe environment, protect them and encourage them and pray for them. Do spiritual warfare on their behalf because they don't know how to do it yet. How do I do that? I'm going to give you a quick example. Uh, I had a friend that I led to Christ many years ago and he was into this hardcore uh, rock and roll, heavy metal music stuff. You know, I didn't know it then. But... But when he gave his heart to God, I was on his case all the time. I made sure I phoned him just about daily. We, we used to work together. So I gave him my Dake's Bible, which is like nobody gets my Dake's Bible. And if you write in it or scratch in it or, 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 or do anything with it, you will be dealt in the same manner with. Okay. <laughs> I just, you know. <laughs> But I gave him my Dake's Bible because he showed interest to study the Word of God. And I said to him, right, you take this, this book and read it, and Dake's will explain everything to you that you need to know. And he did that. And I also made an effort to go to his house to see what's going on in his house. Because I know that when I get to his house, I can see the strongholds. And when I walked into this house, there was a big post on one of the walls with one of the pictures they have on these CDs with ACDC and I don't know what else. And I said to him, Brent, what is that? He says, oh, no, that's the music. You know, that's the poster from the music. I said, oh, really? Do you know what that guy says when he sings? Oh, no, it's cool, man. I said, no, no, hang on. Just get me that CD. Just put it on. 
why? I said, well, ac- actually, Ben, does the, the, the CD have words to it? He says, yeah. I said, just give me the paper quickly. And then I read the words to him, and I said to him, wow, do you think this is encouraging? Do you think God likes this? And then he goes, no, God can't like that. Uh, but, but I like the music. Uh, wha- okay, well, what are you going to do? What God likes or what you like because of your old nature? So he says, well, what do I do with this eventually? He comes to work, and he says, you know what? I said to him, when I left him, I said, Brent, you pray about this. I want you to ask God what he feels about this music. He says, but Niels, you don't understand. I've got stacks of CDs of these things and records. They lived on a high hill in, in Nelspruit. <laughs> so he comes to work about two days later, and he says, he says, I want to talk to you. I said, what's it? He says, um, I prayed about it. I said, and? He says, I just get this feeling I've got to get rid of this stuff. I, what do I do with it? Can I give it to some friends? I said, no, don't give the devil to friends. You don't want them to be get a st- to go astray. <laughs> what do I do about it? I say, do you like, pl- you know, do you like flying saucers? He says, what do you mean? I said, chuck them in the fire or just you live li- li- nice and high on the hill. Just phew, see how far they can float away from you. <laughs> and he actually went the next day and he did that. I don't know what the valley looks like with all the rubbish that went and landed there. But okay, he didn't do all of it. He, he burned some of it. And he came to work again and he said to me, you know what, I just feel so free. I said, you know why? Because one stronghold has been broken in your life. And so I worked through the problems, go to his house and just sit there and the Holy Spirit will just show you things and tell you things. And, and so you can help these people to overcome. That's spiritual warfare, people. Okay. We don't have to scream and shout and call demons and all these things. Yes, there is a place in certain circumstances for something similar than that, but it's not the general warfare that we're talking about. Right, another reason is the pain of life. When we have pain in life, the the devil comes in the the season of temptation and takes place when the pain of life comes. Uh, settles in on us the devil is a master masterful in attacking us with painful situation both mind and body sick bodies and sick minds become his playground have you noticed that when you're sick you feel down sometimes you get depressed and something i don't like is when you know they tell us just close your curtains slow you know make the room dark i go no why not this is just a joke. This is just my joke. Or, in a way, what I really believe as well. <laughs> okay? Sometimes, I, have you felt that in the, in the, when, you, when you got flu or when you're sick, during the day you sort of handle it, but when the sun sets at night, it gets worse? Have you noticed that? My opinion, not Bible opinion, my opinion, the devil walks around in the dark. In the dark. <laughs> So I don't like a dark room. You can leave my light on all night while I sleep. I'll be quite happy with that. Not because I'm scared of the dark. I just don't like the dark. Just because of a silly little belief I've got. The devil likes the dark. I don't like the dark. I like the light. (laughs) Just my joke. Just my simple, stupid belief. Okay. Not necessarily right. All right? Good. So his aim is to sow about um, a doubt and confusion and to weaken our faith. So when you're sick and you keep praying and you keep praying and you keep praying and nothing happens, don't you just get discouraged? Don't you say sometimes like David said to the Lord, Lord, where are you? You know, my enemies don't even serve you. They don't sit with all these ailments and sicknesses. I'm praying and praying and praying and I'm not getting healed. Lord, hello. I went to go and see my doctor this week, and he said to me, um, how's your back? I said, my back's perfectly fine, thank you. He says, did you go and see the physiotherapist? No, you didn't. You're a bad patient. I said, yes, maybe I am. He says, so what's, how's your back? I said, no, my back's fine. I prayed for it because I didn't want to go to the th- physiotherapist. He says, why not? He says, because the physio- I said, because the physiotherapist gives me exercises to do, and I'm not faithful in doing them. 
so, and I don't like doing the exercises. <laughs> he says, okay, well, I'm also like that. I said, yeah, well, so I prayed for my back. And the pain is gone. And he looked at me in disbelief. I said, hey, I'm a preacher. It's part of my job description. The job description. I have to have faith in God. <laughs> he just laughed. <laughs> all right. But people, it, it's all about the devil wants to sow confusion. And he wants to sow doubt in our hearts. All right. So, and he does that when we are down and we're sick. Right. Now. When um, in Acts chapter 9, verse 16, we, if somebody can just read it to us quickly. Um, I've got it somewhere. Can someone just read Acts 9, 16? So what happened here is this is Saul, Saul's conversion, Paul's conversion. Okay, he was Saul, so he got on the road of um, Damascus. You know we, what happened to him? He got blind, and God spoke to him, and God called him. And then um, God sent him to someone to pray for him, remember? And so that his eyes can be opened. Okay, but this person said, Lord, you don't understand. This man persecuted the church. They didn't know that Saul had now given his heart to God and he was converted. This man persecuted the church. And God's word to that man was, I will show him how much he has to suffer for my name. You just go pray for him. You just do what I tell you. And I will show Paul how much he has to suffer for my name. Now listen what God did not say. God did not say, I will show him what great revivals will take place in his ministry. God did not say, I will show him the great missionary efforts that he will be involved in. God did not say that I will, uh, that, that he will, tent the one road, a big, the biggest part of the New Testament for the church to come. God did not say that he will have great impact on the church until the return of the Lord. He said, I will show him how much he has to suffer for my name. Now, sometimes that is a big issue for us because if we start suffering, we think it's the devil busy with me. You see, we've got to just find out, is the suffering because of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Am I being persecuted because of the gospel of Christ? Or am I just being persecuted because of wrong thoughts? Am I suffering because I'm not doing the right thing? Am I suffering because I thought that there was going to be this big revival, and now there's not revival. Now they're looking to kill me, and I've got to be let down the wall to escape these people. we just got to find out what is going on in our life. What is God busy doing in my life? Because that will help me to overcome the attacks of some attacks of the enemy on my life, and that will also help me to understand sometimes this is not the devil that's busy with me necessarily. This is God taking me through a situation to encourage me, to strengthen me because he's got something bigger and, we, and we'll get to that point now. Right, so I will show him how much you suffer for. I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. If Paul only knew. But come on, let's be honest. Do you think the sufferings Paul went through was bigger than the impact he has even on the church today? Those sufferings were nothing. I think Paul today says, guys, you don't know. Those sufferings was bad. But it's nothing in comparison to the things that God did in and through me for his church. And even today, people read my letters because of the things God did in my life and through me. Right. Don't give up. Your miracle is on its way. The danger time, at the beginning of a great victory, the devil goes on the attack when he becomes alert to the fact that something significant is about to happen. Have you ever decided that for now, for the next two weeks, I'm going to fast and pray, or I'm going to really just 
get down and really see God's face. And by the end of the first week, things start falling apart in your life. <laughs> the devil can sense when God is going to do something great in your life. He sees by your actions that you are seeking God. And if you seek God, God has to come through. God promises that he will come through. And if we seek God, God will come through and God will use me more abundantly than normally. So he senses what's going on and then he thinks, I've got to distract this person somehow. I've had it in my life. When you earnestly start praying or fasting, man, the next thing, the whole world falls apart around you. Because the devil doesn't want you to fast and pray. Why? Because certain things, and this is scripture, the disciples came back to Jesus when, when, when there was a, a, a child that had um, the, the falling sickness, mind sick, I don't know what you call it in English now, um, uh, like an epilepsy attacks. And they said, Lord, why could, and Jesus said, well, bring the child to me because the parents said, we, your disciples prayed for him and, and, he could, and they couldn't heal him. So Jesus said, well, bring the child to me. And Jesus healed him from that. And then the disciples said to Jesus, why couldn't we heal him? Because, and Jesus answered, because this one will only go out by prayer and fasting. In other words, we have to put a real effort in. To, for, uh, and, and, I'm, and I hope, I don't want you to understand me wrong. It's not by my works. Okay, it's by the grace of God. But God sometimes wants to use us for something bigger, but he wants to separate us. He wants to set us aside. He wants us to really seek his face so that he can do this bigger work. And the devil senses that, and he will distract you. He will make sure that you don't spend all that time in prayer. He will make sure that you don't fast as much as you want to fast. He will make sure that you are distracted so that God's plan in your life will not come into fulfillment. Are you with me? All part of spiritual warfare. All right. So, he will send the Tobiah and Sambalat to mock the wall builders. In Nehemiah 6, we see that Joshua and them decided he got permission to rebuild the walls. Okay. And then these two guys actually hired a prophet to prophet against him, tell lies. And then they went and mocked him. Oh, you really think you're going to rebuild this wall and blah, blah, blah. Okay. Joshua wasn't distracted by that. Fortunately not. He kept building the wall. All right. He will put Paul and Barnabas to odds so that they can part their ways in Acts chapter 15. So uh, Paul um, said, well, I want to take Mark with me uh, to go and preach to the Jews. And then Barnabas said, no ways is Mark coming with us. I don't like the guy. And then Paul and, and Barnabas parted ways. Was it bad? They thought so. But the good thing about this is that's where the gospel started going to the Gentiles as well. Not only to the Jews. All right. So he attacked Jesus at the beginning of his ministry and assailed him all the way through. And then the bitterly attack at the end, which he thought he won Jesus. But Jesus says, nobody took my life. I gave it. All right. So, when God is about to do something great in your life, you might find that things seem to get out of hand. All right. So, then I, what I call the smoke screen, the lies, after receiving great grace. Okay, look at the life of Peter, Matthew chapter 16. One minute he has received great revelation, and the next minute the Lord is calling him devil. Get ye behind me, devil. What revelation did he get? Who do you say I am? The other people say I'm John or Elijah. Who do you say I am? He said to the disciples. And Peter said, Lord, you are the son of God. Jesus said, Peter, nobody revealed that to you. Now this rock, what rock? The revelation of who Jesus is. On this rock, I will build my church. And I want, just a while later, Peter suggested something to Jesus. And Jesus said, you don't understand, man. Get you behind me, devil. You see, even though he had this great revelation, he got distracted to such an extent that Jesus had to reprimand him. So just after great victories, we'll find something. Look at what happened to Elijah, to the Baal prophets. All right? This massive victory on the mountain. The Baal prophets cut themselves. He had them killed because their God didn't answer with fire. And straight after that, he got the message, 
that Jezebel is looking for you to kill you. What did he go and do? He ran away from this woman. Really? You see, so this, this is what happens. This is how the devil attacks you. All right. So the other thing, look at Joseph in Genesis. He got this a vision from God. He shares it with his brothers. All the other, um, uh, what's it in English? All the other grain will bow before me, okay? And they will serve me. And, and he had this vision that God gave him. I'm going to be great. And what happens? <laughs> he, his brothers wants to kill him and then sells him as, as a slave. And he goes to Egypt and then he gets put in jail, in prison, because of something he, for something he didn't do. All right? All in God's plan. Don't get discouraged by the devil. Don't let the devil distract you. Okay. So the, um, then the next thing, look at the children of Israel collapsing the walls of Jericho and then days later rattled by I by much lesser, in I by a much lesser opponent. That happened to them because they were disobedient. Well, one guy, Achan, was disobedient. He took of the spoils that was cursed when they fought against that nation. Okay? And then God said, <laughs> something wrong. Just before that, they had this massive victory about the Jericho walls falling in. Now there's something terribly wrong. Okay? This is how the devil, he got distracted by the desires of life. Look at Moses. He receives, he goes up in the mountain, spends some time with God, and he gets the tablets with the Ten Commandments. He comes down. What happened? Aaron... Can you believe it? Got the people to make a golden calf, and they did, uh, they, and they worshipped the golden calf, idolatry. Really? And he got so angry that he threw the tablets down and broke them. After a massive victories, I mean, just imagine spending forty days up in a mountain, where the power of God is so upon you that when you come down the mountain, the mountain people can't even look at your face because it's so shining with the glory of God. And the next thing, the devil says, ha, ha, let's just get this guy off his little high that he's on. All right, and he got it right. So, the desires of life is the next one. Judas fell for the money bag. This is one of the biggest problems in our day. People fall for the money bag. People can just, they don't care if, they, if, if what happens in their life. If I can just get a good job where I can make good money, man, and they just see all this gold, and they just see all these houses they will buy, and they just see all these things they will buy. And, and, and there's nothing wrong with being wealthy. Make no mistake. Okay. It's not money that's the problem. It's the love for money that's the problem. Okay. So some people fall for that. Okay. Esau f fell for a bowl of stew. I can't think that anybody would be that stupid. <laughs> but I suppose when you love stew and, you lo and you're very hungry and that stew is cooking in that slow cooker and you come home and you go, ah. And she says, you can't eat it, you're on a diet. You go, ah, forget the diet. <laughs> Give me the stew. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, Demas fell because of his love for the world. In 2 Timothy 2.4.10, Paul says, And Demas left us because he's, of Timothy, he said, Demas left us because he loved the world. He fell in love with the world again. Went back to his old ways. Have you seen that happen in the church? People have great victories. Man, I've seen people have great victories. Preachers. And the next time you see they're down in the dumps and they're down and out. And you wonder, what happened in this person's life? Something must have gone terribly wrong. The devil knew something good was going to come out of his ministry. And I had to stop this somehow. The problem is that person either didn't know about spiritual warfare or he was his own problem in this whole situation. He believed the lie of the devil. So... 
Achan fell because of his longing for a wedge of gold and garment. That's where the, they lost the battle in Ai against a much lesser uh, uh, um, group of people. He decided he's going to take the spoil. He just wanted this gold and he wanted this robe when they were winning this battle and there was all these spoils. And God told him, don't take anything because it's cursed. He just said, oh, look at this gold. And look at, wow, look at this robe. I'm going to take it from you. Okay, and they lost the battle. And 36 of their people died in this battle that sh they should have won easily. Okay, because they went in with 3,000 men. They went in to go and spy. And they, the spies came back and says, man, you know what? We only need 3,000 guys. We can wipe these guys out. It's a small group of people. They went into battle, they lost 36 people, and David was in tears around this. Like, what has happened here? What has gone wrong? And God says, somebody took some of the spoils that was cursed. Find out who it was. And eventually they took tribe by tribe, and, the, and, and they came down to Achan. And they took Achan and his whole family into the valley, and they killed them there. So his whole family paid for that sin. The Bible is interesting, isn't it? But that is after they had the big victories, okay? And that this is the desires of life. People fall for the desires of life. Sometimes the, the, the job offer just looks too good, you know, and I have to take this. Sometimes the, the 100 million lotto looks so good. If I can win that, imagine. Come on, people. Have you, haven't you sat and said, what will we do with all this money when we won it? <laughs> okay and you go wow i'll give this one so much i'll give that one so much i'll give that one i'll give that i'll give that and i always say oh rubbish man if you can't give a ten dollars of a hundred dollar stars how will you give a hundred thousand of a million come on don't fool yourself don't try and fool me i know better than that all right so joshua chapter seven we can read about that what does the Bible say in Proverbs 4.23? And we're closing with this. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Keep your heart focused on God. Because if we do not, that is when we get tempted by all these desires of life. That is when we, get, we believe the lies of the devil. And that is when the devil can distract us from God's plan in our lives. The second scripture, Proverbs 23. By the way, it's on the, on the Bible and on the app in the phones. I keep on forgetting to tell you, but you, you know it's on there. Huh? All right. Proverbs 23, 19. Hear thou, my son, and be wise, and guide thine heart in the way. Guide your heart. Why? Because out of the, out of the, 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 the good things and the bad things comes from the heart. So if I guard my heart against the bad things, the good things will come out of my heart. Okay, you cannot act in a way that, uh, uh, or act in a, yeah, a certain way that, that is not within you. you. You act from what you believe. You act from what is in your heart. Okay, so therefore we can sometimes see the fruit in people's lives because they act from what is inside. Okay, so it's not the bacon I eat for breakfast that makes me a pig. It's the pig in the heart that makes me bad. Okay, so... Colossians 3 verse 2 says, set your affections on the things above, not on the things of the earth. And, and the people, these things are not always easy. You know, we talk about it like it's easy things to do. It's, I know it's not easy. It's a battle. God calls it a battle. We've read the scriptures. He says, stand firm against these schemes of the devil. It's a battle, but if we endure, we will, f we will get the prize. Amen? Now, so next week we... God willing, we'll carry on to see what is the three main things that prevent me from getting victory. Okay, let us pray together. Father, we just thank you for your word. We thank you that we know this day that, Lord, the devil is no match against you. And therefore, we, if we live in Christ, if we have Christ in our hearts, and if we guard our hearts against the schemes and the wiles of the devil, we will have victory over all these things, Lord. And you will help us and you will guide us. So I pray, God, that you'll help us to understand that when we talk about the spiritual warfare, 
it's a battle that's already been won by Christ for us. But we need to take that victory in Jesus' name by uh, just applying the things that we heard this morning. We ask it all in the wonderful name of Jesus, and I thank you for it, Lord. Amen.